Psalm 19, of course, is the source text for this line of thought. The heavens are telling the glory of God. That's the mandate to study the book of nature. And it's reinforced in that passage I read in Romans. God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been seen and understood through the things that God has made. There's a clear sense that when we look at God's theater and when we try to study it and understand it, it tells us something about God. Now, what you may have noticed, I asked Elliot to read the entire Psalm 19. You may have noticed there's a shift in there, right? Around verse 7, we stop talking about celestial objects and motions, and we start talking about the law of the Lord, the decrees of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord. This is that important mandate to read the book of Scripture, to look back at the Torah, to look at the revelation of God in the Bible. And this is one today that the church sticks pretty well to, right? It's something we pay attention to. We focus on the book of Scripture every Sunday in worship. However, I think we've lost, like Boyle was concerned about, this sense of reading the book of nature. We've kind of left that to the guild of scientists, many of whom are not like Jennifer Weissman, who grew up in the church and that are seeking to understand what the heavens might be declaring. And I'm pretty convinced that work is very fruitful. Those of you that were in the Hassas class this morning will get a sense of why I'm convinced that line of thinking is very fruitful. And so Hassas this year, about once a month, we've been doing a a series of courses on science telling the glory of God, which I've led using a a, a curriculum that we developed for science for the church. Today we had the privilege of Jennifer joining us and just showing us images and helping us to see, as an astronomer sees it, how the heavens declare. And I want you to get a glimpse of that this morning. So we're going to, I'm going to invite Jennifer back up here, and she's going to do a reading from the book of nature. I invite you to open up your bulletins. There is an image in there of Stefan's quintet. You'll get an explanation of that in just a moment. And I invite you to look at it. There's a QR code. So if you have an electronic device and you want to scan it and pull it up to be able to look more closely at it, you're welcome to. But I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer to help us understand what are we looking at and what might it be telling us about God's theater. Um, So one example is this amazing picture here, and Stefan's Quintet is a, what we call a compact group of galaxies. So just to remind you what a galaxy is, a galaxy is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars. So when you see a picture of a galaxy, sometimes all that starlight is just kind of blended together. And our own sun is one star in a galaxy known as the Milky Way. We're inside the Milky Way galaxy, and we can't get all the way out of it to take a picture of the Milky Way as a whole. But we can look out at other galaxies, and some of them are close to each other. So when they're close enough to each other, they can feel each other's gravitational pull. And sometimes galaxies even merge together. When they're close enough, they feel each other's gravitational tug and will actually be drawn together into one larger galaxy. We think our own Milky Way is the product of mergers from other smaller galaxies and that we will merge eventually with the Andromeda galaxy. We're moving in that direction. So merging is a part of this dramatic activity in the universe. This group of galaxies is an example of several that are close enough to each other that they're kind of feeling each other's pull. And as they move around and kind of pass each other and orbit around each other, it's, it's a cosmic dance. It's really beautiful to think of. And as you look at those galaxies on the right, you can see some of them already being pulled into kind of unified entities. You can even see material kind of being pulled off of uh, uh, the edges of of these galaxies toward their neighbors. These are called tidal tails that are before and behind some of these galaxies. They're swirling around each other, eventually going to merge together. 
What a beautiful cosmic dance. Um, now, these galaxies are not all at the same distance, so the ones that are feeling each other's tug are the ones on the right-hand side and the bottom left. But the one on the upper left, you see it looks a little bit different. It's got different colors. Um, that's because it's actually not close to the other galaxies. It's in the same visual field of view, but it's much closer. So that one is about 40 million light years away. That means it's taken 40 million years for the light to get to us. And these other galaxies are more like 490 million light years away. So they're much farther away, and yet they kind of appear juxtaposed from our, from our vantage point. So that, too, is an amazing part of this image to me, right? That we can see different depths into the universe, and they tell us things from different epochs of time. The closer things to us, we're seeing them from not as far back in time. The farther things, it's taken light longer to get to us, so we're looking a little bit farther back into their own history and into the history of the universe. So from this, I think you can see several qualities, right? You see, first of all, beauty, I hope, in, in the the symmetry, the, the spiral arms, you can see these star clusters, these purplish clusters around the outskirts of these galaxies. Those are hot spots that because of the turbulence in these galaxies and in their interactions, it's stirring up new star formation. So new stars are still forming. We see beauty. We see the fruitfulness of star formation, planets probably forming around those stars as well. We see interactions that galaxies are, are aware of each other in the sense of their gravitational pull. They're being pulled together. We see different histories, different depths into the universe where we see more detail in that galaxy that's closer to us. And uh, I think we see provision because it's this kind of interaction that actually spawns the new star formation and, uh, and is a part of our own galaxy's history as well. So um, I hope you enjoy this picture as just a glimpse of some of the activity, the magnitude, and the beauty of the universe. So. Thank you, Jennifer. So if you're anything like me, those kinds of images, those things we're learning and seeing, whether it's through Hubble or Webb, whether it's walking in nature, whether it's images looking through a telescope and seeing the smallest things, they inspire me to worship. That wonder, that amazement, that beauty inspires me to worship, and it makes me think of a well-known quote. How many of you are familiar with the name Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, recent director? Uh, served under three different presidents of the um, National Institutes of Health. In an interview with CNN several years ago, when he was asked about his, his life as a Christian and as a scientist, he said the following, by investigating God's majestic and awesome creation, science can actually be a means of worship. And for Francis Collins and for many others, that actual doing of science is a means of worship. And so if it were up to me, probably won't be anytime soon, but if it were up to me, almost every Sunday we would do a reading from the book of nature along with our scripture texts for, that, for the morning. We'd look at images from microscopes and telescopes. We'd bring in ideas from psychology and physics and chemistry. And we'd leverage the scientists that are in our church and in our community to help us see God's glory and to understand it. <clears throat> 